Thank you, Othniel, for the reading of the word. And I pray that everyone has been blessed so far by this service. The message today is entitled, The Christian's Response to Trials. The Christian's Response to Trials. Bow with me in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for this time that we can come and open up your word to us, O God. I was not there when you gave these inspired texts to your apostle John. In fact, none of us were present. But God, you have sent your Holy Spirit into our hearts that we can know your truth. And with that same Holy Spirit, we depend on you today, O oh God, to understand your word. May hearts be changed. May lives be changed. May we understand the Christian's response to trials today. And may we come out pure goal, giving you the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We would have just read John chapter 16, verses 24 to 33. And just to give you a context, what's going on, this is what the theologians like to call Jesus' upper room discourse. From John chapter 13 to John chapter 16, Jesus has left the public's eyes. There's no more public teaching going on. There's just this special time that he is spending with his disciples. So they call this the upper room discourse. These disciples have been brought into an upper room. And Jesus is spending this time preparing the disciples because he is about to leave them. He is about to go to the cross just a few hours from here and die for the sins of his people. You see, John chapter 16 verses 24 to 33 is so important this morning because these is Jesus' final words. To his disciples before he goes to the cross. And basically he has been saying one central message in this upper room discourse. I'm going to leave to go to the father. I know that sounds strange. But it's going to be better for you. Because I'm sending you the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is going to be your helper, helper your comforter. The Holy Spirit is going to do for the disciples what Jesus has been doing for the last three years. And the fa in fact, the Holy Spirit is going to do for all of us what Jesus has been doing with these disciples for the last three years. So no longer is Jesus going to be confined to this physical upper room discourse with these special disciples. But he is now unleashed into all his people through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now the disciples didn't understand all of this. All they heard was Jesus saying in verse 28, if you have your Bibles open, I want you to keep your Bibles to John 16 verses 24 to 33 as we expound, as, as we expound this text this morning. But I want you to see it. In John 16 verse 28, Jesus says, I came from the Father and I came into the world and now I am leaving. That's all the disciples heard. Huh? Leaving? Where are you going, Jesus? We want the Jesus who, he, who fed the 5,000 to stay right here. We want the Jesus who calmed the sea when the seas was roaring. We want that Jesus to stay with us. We ain't want him but no leaving Jesus. That's what the disciples, they didn't understand anything else. All they heard was, I'm leaving. And he says, he's going back to the Father. Think about your loved one. Loved one that you had before they died, the final words they would have told you. This is the magnitude of the moment the disciples are in. Or think about the first time your parents them sent you to college if you're if you went to college already, and they left you, and they say, Well, it's gonna be better because you're gonna learn some things, you're gonna grow, you're gonna develop in college, but we're not gonna be there. We're not going to physically be there. That's what was put before these disciples. And they were very confused. Because not only is Jesus leaving. But he said they're going to experience trials when he's gone. 
They, they, they think about this. They've been experiencing trials with Jesus being there. And they know how rough it was. But every problem they had, Jesus solved it. And Jesus says, I'm leaving. But now it could be more trials after I'm gone. You see in John 16 verse 33, Jesus says, I've said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. But take heart, for I have overcome the world. In other words, Jesus is saying, in this world that we live in, you will have tribulation. You will have stress. You will have suffering. But we are to be courageous. Confident. We are to be filled with joy. Because why? Jesus Christ has overcome the world. And now that Jesus is living in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. You see when Jesus uses this term in the world. He's not really talking about a physical place per se. He is talking about this system of evil. That was set up by the God of this world, Satan. Small g. Because he ain't, he ain't no big g. He's a small g. There's only one big g. And even, like Martin Luther says, even the devil is God's devil. The devil don't control nothing. God can, is in complete control. Say amen. But what Satan has done, he has created this system of evil. System of greed. That's governed by sin. And this system hates Jesus Christ and his followers. So when Jesus says, in this world you will have tribulation, he's talking about this system of evil. You know, Jesus was not lying to these disciples. After Jesus left, most of these disciples were martyred. But one, the apostle who writes to us today, John. Peter was crucified upside down. Thomas was spared. He was killed with a spear in his side. And this John, as tradition has it, they tried to kill the apostle John. They had boiling oil that they put John in. But God kept John miraculously alive and saved him from death. And this apostle John is now writing to us. He looks around and all of the apostles are dead. You know, the Roman ruler was so furious that he couldn't kill the Apostle John that he banned him to the island of Patmos, this Greek island. And it was there that the Apostle John got the vision from Jesus and wrote the book of Revelation. So Jesus was not lying that they were going to experience trials. In fact, that's exactly what happened. And you see, for these disciples in this moment... The thought of Jesus leaving and the seeing people who, who killed Jesus on the cross would be hunting them down to kill them too. That is going through their minds and their hearts are filled with fear. It was stress. This by far would be the greatest test the disciples will ever have to walk through. What I like about the gospel of Jesus Christ, it faces reality. Jesus is not saying that this world we live in today is not going to give us stress. He's saying you will have tribulation. Mark it on your calendar. It's going to happen. But what is the Christian's response? We got to take courage. Because we know one who is the firstborn among many brethren, Jesus Christ, who has overcome the world. You see, it's like you're getting ready to take an exam and then your best friend say, well, yeah, I took the exam, it was hard. But I could give you some tips on how to pass it. That's what Jesus is doing here. And this world that Jesus speaks about, it didn't get any better from when he said 2,000 years ago, there'll be trials, you know. In fact, the world has gotten worse in sin. Yes, mankind has grown smarter with technology and smartphones and knowledge. But you know what that's done? It's only given us smarter ways to sin. Smarter ways to kill. Smarter ways to murder. 
Technology cannot solve our greatest problem of sin. You see, I just came back from a trip in Atlanta, me and my wife, and, you know, <laughs> I checked my, my account uh, the other day, about two days ago, and I recognized there were some charges that I didn't made on my credit card. You see, they say you got the chip card now. It's very difficult for people to hack into that. This world we live in, they're always looking for ways to keep the sin out. But the problem is the sin is in mind. And what we found out was potentially somebody would have taken my card and wrote down the card number, took a picture of it when we were out to dinner, talking to the agent over the phone. This happens a lot because they cannot get into it with, you know, your card is chinned with a pin. I mean, it's, it's pinned with a chip. So they don't know your code. But hey, if you go out to dinner and you put your card down in the slot, the waiter comes back, who knows? He could have taken your card down. They go on a website where they don't really need a pin and they use your credit card. I was talking to a friend of mine, well, a cousin the other day, and he told me somebody was stealing his identity on Facebook in order to use his picture to talk to other females. I mean, this is the world we're living in, man. It's like, you know, <laughs> you think with more technology, people will get better. No, they get smarter and how to sin. And how to, to hurt people. And one does not even have to look at Jesus' words this morning. But we can look at this present world we live in. Corona. Wars. Rumors of wars. Increase in murder. Financial burdens. Recession. They say we're in a recession now. Increase in gas prices. My friends, it's becoming extremely difficult to live in this world. And because of the current state of sin in this world, people are becoming extremely anxious, fearful. I was reviewing the, stati the, st the statistics on suicide the other day, and they said suicide rates have increased in 2020 when the start of COVID happened for young adults between the ages of 25 to 34. And what that's telling me today is as the world grows more sinful, people are becoming more fearful. And we do not know how to handle these fears. And my friends, I'm, I'm telling you the truth this morning. I'm not one of those false prophets who is trying to tell you a season of blessing has come. I'm telling you what Jesus says in Matthew 24 verse 8. He says, all of these are but the birth pains of sorrow. Things are going to get a lot worse before Christ returns. So the question is, if you're a Christian, how are you going to respond to the trials of the world that's kicking at your door every day? So if trials are certain, let's get out of this world where we think we're not going to experience anything. Let's come here where Jesus says, in the world you will have tribulation. If trials are certain, the big question is, how do we live in this world? How do we live in a hostile world that's growing more sinful and evil as we speak? How were the disciples able to live after Jesus told them he was leaving? And that they knew that people were coming to kill them. Well, the good news I have for you this morning is that the Christian is not someone who just survived trials. <laughs> Paul calls us more than conquerors in Romans 8. We are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. This Jesus who went to the Father, he didn't send back an angel. He didn't send back someone else. He sent back his spirit. His Holy Spirit is living in the believer. And His Spirit, oh, the Holy Spirit knows how to overcome the world. So Jesus Christ has given us everything we need to live in this world as overcomers. And I want to give you five things that we need to know about this text this morning that will help us to respond to trials. The first thing is submit to the work of the Holy Spirit. 
Jesus says, I'm going, but I'm sending you the Holy Spirit. It means your relationship with the Holy Spirit is going to be of vital importance to overcoming trials. You see, this Holy Spirit whom Jesus will send, he tells us in John 14, verse 16 to 18, he's going to be a helper. He's going to be with us forever. And he is going to be called the Spirit of Truth. Say, Spirit of Truth. In a world of lies, don't we need the spirit of truth? We need the spirit of truth. And you know, you know what's so good about the Holy Spirit? It says, whom the world cannot receive. It's just given to the believer. It's what, the, it's what I like to call the, the secret advantage of the believer. The world cannot receive him because it doesn't know Jesus Christ. But the Bible says, you know him. For he dwells in you and will be in you. And Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. So the Holy Spirit is this helper that we have. He knows what we need before we ask. He knows about the troubles that we face. And, 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 and sometimes we ought to just bring our request to God. Don't keep it to ourselves. You see, the Holy Spirit has given us this access to the Father. Yes, there's a change in the relationship. You know, Jesus makes this certain in John 16, verse 24. He says, until now, he's talking to his disciples, you have not asked anything in my name. So until now, you know, when the disciples had a problem, Jesus would go and pray about it and then come back. The disciples would just be standing up watching. Jesus, you, you, you asked the Father, but how are we can feed these 5,000? Okay. But now the difference in the relationship is this. Jesus says, you can go and ask the Father yourself. You can go straight in to the holies of holies, man. You see, he says, until now, you have not asked anything in my name. Man, you got to stress, talk to God. Talk to the Father. That's what the Holy Spirit is there for. And he says, that you may be filled with joy. And you know, in verse, in verse 20, 20, 20, um, 26 to 27, he says, in that day, you will ask in my name. So in asking in Jesus' name, asking according to the Father's will. It's not saying anything we ask, God can do. Don't pray that God give you a billion dollars, because that ain't happening. Pray the Father's will. All right? Just ask that he protect you. Think about the Our Father prayer. Simple stuff. Jesus said to pray for. Simple stuff. You know, pray that you do not be led into temptation, that he'll deliver you from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for now and ever. The, the simple stuff. Give us our daily bread. Give us grace. Let the Father answers that perfectly. But the problem is we want what we want. So we use the Holy Spirit to get what we, try to get what we want and God say, you don't need that. You know, like them little babies, they want candy all the time and the mother saying, no, that, that's not good for you. Too much candy ain't good. So the Holy Spirit answers those prayers that are in accordance with the Father's will. You know, so we have to realize that we have access to the Father. In Romans 5 verse 1 to 2, Paul tells us, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him. Through the work of the cross. This is what we get. We have also obtained Access. Say access. Access. We have access to the Father by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of glory. Now that might not seem like a lot right now. But if you, if you really understood Judaism and Old Testament theology and what the Jews had to do to get a hearing to the Father. You see, you could not just walk into the holies of holies. In the Old Testament, it was the outer courts, the inner courts in the temple, and then it was this special place called the Holies of Holies. That represented where the Father dwelt. And once a year, the high priest, because you had to be in a high priest from the tribe of Aaron, the high priest would go into the Holies of Holies. God said nobody else could come, only this high priest, one high priest. And then he had to come with a sacrifice and had to be in a perfect lamb. And the lamb that he brought was sacrificed and they sprinkled blood on the mercy seat. Because you have to appeal to the Father's mercy. And the people would be waiting outside the, te the tent and they waiting for the high priest to come out. If the high priest, if God didn't accept the sacrifice, the high priest is going to die. If he did, 
The high priest would come out cheering and the people would scream, God has received us and God has forgiven us of our sins. And that was the process these people went through. But Jesus Christ has done something this morning. And what I'm saying is, Jesus is our great high priest. He went into the holies of holies. That's what the author of Hebrews says. And when he entered, he was the perfect sacrifice. He was the perfect lamb. He's also the high priest, and he's also the perfect sacrifice. And it says, when Jesus entered, he entered with his own blood. The Father was so pleased that he sends us the Holy Spirit. And that's what the Apostle Paul is saying. We have this access to the Father. Ephesians 2 verse 18 says, For through Christ we both have access into one spirit to the Father. So yes, we need to remember that we have the Holy Spirit. We're enjoying peace with God, access to the Father, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory. So we need to treasure this, that we can come boldly before the Father and bring our troubles with us when we come. Lay it at his feet. Lay it at his feet. The second point I want to say is that we need to receive the Father's love. If you look at verse 27, Jesus says, look, why is God giving you this access? Because the Father himself loves you. It's not just Jesus who loves you. The Father loves you. And why does the Father love you? Because you have loved me. Jesus is telling these disciples, the Father loves you. Because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. Now what I want you to see is when I talk about receiving the Father's love, I'm not talking about a general love. You know, God so loved the world, that's a general love. But those who believe in Christ will not perish, they get a specific love. It's not talking about the Father who created the world, I'm talking about the Holy Spirit who lives in us. This personal love is what we need to tap into. You see, a lot of people talk about God of love, the God of love. But they don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the people who have the personal relationship with Jesus Christ. They need to tap into that love. Because the Holy Spirit in Romans 5 has been poured into our hearts. No, I mean the love of God has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So we have access to the father. We have access to the personal love. It's like a father telling his grandkids, I love you. That love is so personal. It's way different from the father saying, well, you know, I had some friends back in the day and I, I like to be around them. No, no, Jesus is telling these believers, the father loves you. So what is your response to the work of Christ? Because... Who, you cannot say that you don't believe in Jesus, but you want to talk about the love of the Father. They go hand in hand. So God promises an intimate love for those who believe in Jesus and has received the Holy Spirit. And we need to receive that love in our trials. And the third thing, I would say trust Jesus always in your trial. Notice what the disciples said in verse 30. They says, now we know... You see in disciples who are distressed. Look at, look at the words they say. Now we know that you know all things. They're talking to Jesus. And do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. So the disciples didn't understand too much about how the future would plan out step by step. They know trials was coming. They didn't know everything about the trial. They didn't try to be God in the moment. They were not trying to be the person who understand everything before they walk with Jesus. All they know is this. Jesus, we see in you. We know you come from God. We see all these miracles you do. We know you know all things. And they trusted in him. And that's the picture of the believer's faith. You see, we don't need to know everything about everything in the trial to trust Jesus. We are like sheep. We, are, we still need a shepherd. Yes, we were lost in the world at one time, but when Christ found us, we become found sheep, saved sheep. But we're never going to stop being sheep. 
We, all, we will always be dependent on Jesus. And we have to get used to that relationship of total dependency on Christ alone. And it's not a matter of the size of your faith. Because these disciples had very little in Christ. But they know one thing. They put the very little faith they had in the one who knows all things. So trust Jesus always with whatever you're going through. Even if you don't know how it's going to turn out. Put whatever faith you have in his hands. Fourthly, you know, we talked about first, submit to the work of the Holy Spirit. Receives the Father's love. Trust Jesus always in the trial. And fourthly, strengthen the little faith that you do have. Through the reading of God's word and studying his word. And sometimes, you know, as Christians, we don't really understand how dependent we are on God. Until we go through th certain trials. You know, these disciples they didn't understand exactly all the trials. So, so they thought that when Jesus said this, he is leaving. You know, they thought that once I understand, when I, once I understand this once, that's all that, that matters. I heard Jesus, so let me move on. But faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing. So notice in verse 29 to 30, the disciple says, Ah, now you're speaking plainly. And you're not using any figurative speech. We know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. Good. They put the faith that they had in Jesus. But the problem was this. They thought that once they did that once, that's all they needed to do. You know, there's a teaching that goes around. Just let go and let God handle it. Oh, they say, well, you know, we ain't got to do no more work. We put that little faith in Jesus now. We could go back to sleep. You know, this trial coming. But, you know, Jesus got it, man. Let me tell you something. The trial came. Even though they understood the trial was coming. But they fell. And this is a picture of all of us when we think that we can live the Christian life off the last sermon. You didn't hear what I said. It's a picture of all of us when we think that we know the gospel already. And we can live it based off the last sermon. You see the disciples didn't strengthen the little faith they had with the word. With the gospel. And just a couple hours after this, they will flee and run from Jesus in the trial. Notice what Jesus says in verse 31 to 32. He says, oh, you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered, each to his own home. And, you, and they're going to leave Jesus alone. But Jesus says, yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. You see, despite disciples having this private teaching session with Jesus, they were the most privileged people to ever overcome any trial. Despite having the benefits of this alone time with Jesus, when the trial came, they forgot everything. It is one thing to know the gospel, but it's another thing to apply it in the midst of trials. The reality is for us, even with the Holy Spirit, even with the biblical teaching of the Bible, we forget the gospel every day. We don't need no new revelation. We just need to be reminded of the same old gospel. You see, it's the plan of the enemy for us to underestimate the war that we're in. Yes, Jesus Christ has won the victory. He has won the victory for us. But the Christian is still in a war. Until Christ returns, we'll be in a war. The Bible uses these terms, wrestle. And it's talking to Christians who have the Holy Spirit. And it's saying, for we do not wrestle. Do you think you're in a war? We wrestling. against the, We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. 
That person who made you mad, that's not the real problem. The problem is we wrestle against rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers over the present dark age, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Demons. And that's why when Paul writes to these Christians in Ephesus, he says, don't go on vacation because you got the Holy Spirit. Take up the whole armor of God. That you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand firm. You see, some think the mature Christian is, is this person who already know the gospel. Oh, he don't need to come to church. He don't need to, the, to the fellowship of other believers. He's strong. Yeah, he, he can stand on his own. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12, take heed. Let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. You see, <laughs> we ain't strong. The Bible calls us sheep for a reason. We ain't smart. The Bible calls us sheep for a reason. We will need the shepherd even with the Holy Spirit. We need to draw into him daily. The mature Christian is the one who knows about the sinful flesh. Oh, he knows about the enemy. He knows about the spiritual warfare every day. And he said, look, I'm coming to church because I need to hear the gospel. I'm opening up the Bible every day because I need the word. It's not that we, 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 we just want his presence. We need it. Feed yourself with the word of God. He, he gives us the living waters in the Holy Spirit. The waters where we will never thirst again. That's what you get living in you. Tap into the Holy Spirit. Read the word of God. Study it. Man, live this Christian life. That you give glory to God. And however strong you are today. Just remember. The enemy still desires to sift you like weak. We must keep a posture of total dependency on Christ alone. You know when David fell? Oh, he was a warrior at battle. But when he, when he fell was when he went on vacation and took a look at Bathsheba. Christians don't go on vacation. When it comes to the spiritual matters of God, we need our daily bread. You see, we need our faith to be strengthened. Don't look at the last time you put your trust in Christ. Trust him daily. So how do we strengthen our faith? Well, I said faith comes by hearing. Hey, faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing what? Some of us listening to NBC and every news channel and fair every day. Oh, we religiously listen to the news every day. But let me tell you something. That ain't giving you no faith. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing what? The word of God. Ah, that's what we need. So, we receive power through the hearing of the gospel. And our faith is strengthened so that we can overcome trials. Why should you come to church? Well, simply to hear the gospel preach. Many different reasons, but that's one reason. See, what you have to realize is, God has given us a way to receive power in our weak condition. Paul says in Romans 1 verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the what? What is the power of God? The gospel. For salvation to everyone who believes. So the question is, do you believe that every time you hear the gospel preach, that you are receiving power? You see, this is where a lot of churches go on wrong because they say, everybody already know the gospel, let's move on to miracles and talk about seasons of blessings. Oh, they don't give you no power, by the way. One thing gives you power, the hearing of the gospel. So it's not about if you know Jesus died on the cross. It's not about if you know the story of Christ. It's are you hearing it and is it mixed with faith? You receive power, Every time you hear the gospel and trust Jesus Christ, there's a transformation going on. There's a supernatural transformation going on in the hearts of believers every time the gospel is preached. 
you receive power every time the gospel is preached. Listen to John Calvin, that great Christian reformer, 15, 1600s. But look what he says when he talks about this power that's coming from the gospel. He says, note how much Paul attributes the ministry of the word when he declares that God exerts his power there for our salvation. And you know, we like to go on, you know, people going on these secret revelation. Just read the word of God. You don't need a new prophet. The word of God is alive. Sharp with on any two-edged sword. What you going to battle with? The word. Expound the text in front of you. He says, look, John Calvin says, when we talk about this power that's coming from the word, he's not speaking here of any secret revelation. God gave everyone the Holy Spirit that leads and guides into all truth who are believers. It's not just for the prophet or the pastor. It's for every believer. No secret in the kingdom of God. You see, he says he's not talking about any secret revelation. But of preaching by the word of mouth. There's a lot of ways that God could have choose to give his believers powers on earth. But he did it through the preaching of the gospel. And that's why we need to hear the gospel preach every day. In the word, in church, wherever we are, listen to the gospel. John Calvin further goes on to say it follows from this. That those who withdraw themselves from the hearing of the word preached are willfully rejecting the power of God and repelling his hand of deliverance far from them. You see, many churches have turned the Bible into psychology. Believe in yourself. Find your purpose. So you could get God to bless you with everything you want in life. That's not the gospel. The gospel is we're sheep. We're weak. And we like that woman in John 4, when Jesus found us, we was drinking from the natural waters. And he came and he said, I have waters that you drink from this, you will never thirst again. He gave us the living waters in the Holy Spirit. The gospel is about Jesus Christ, his person, his work. We need to hear what he has done, what he's continuously doing for our salvation. And that's where we receive his power. Many churches are starving their members from the true power of God because they are preaching another gospel. The Apostle Paul, this is not something new in our generation. This is something that started even back in the Apostle Paul's day. He said there were many theologians, many, many philosophers, many people who like to talk about man's wisdom, the wisdom of so-and-so. But he says, look, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you, I came to you, I did not come to pro pro proclaim it to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. L listen to what Paul preached. For I decided to know nothing among you except what? Jesus Christ and him crucified. All Paul was preaching is the person and the work of Christ. Christ died for your sins. He rose again. He's giving you the Holy Spirit. He's interceding for you at the Father now before the right hand of the Father. And you got the Holy Spirit. You got what you need. I don't need another revelation. And Paul says in verse 3 to 5 of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he says that when I was with you in weakness, he said, I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. God doesn't use powerful people. He puts his powerful Holy Spirit in weak vessels. And he says in verse 4, and my speech and my message was not in plausible words of wisdom. But what was it? It was demonstration of the spirit and of power. So that your faith, the faith of every believer would not rest in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. That's why it's important to be in a church that preaches the gospel. Because we are weak and we need to hear the gospel every day. Lastly, we talked about receiving and submitting to the work of the Holy Spirit, receiving the Father's love, trusting in Jesus, strengthening our faith with the word of God. And when you have done all, 
all that you can do, you look to Jesus. You look to Jesus because he is the one who says he has overcome the world. He is the one who passed every test. You see, he overcame this sinful world that we talked about. And the Christian in Hebrews chapter 12 is running this race with patience. And his one place the Christian eyes is on is in Jesus. We are looking to Jesus. Why? Because he is the author and the finisher of our faith. And what that means is that we have one who did experience the trials and he experienced it alone he did it just with him knowing the father was with him listen to what he says behold the hour is coming in verse 32 indeed it has come when all the disciples will be scattered each to his own home and will leave me alone yet i'm not alone for the Father is with me. Jesus is so powerful. You see, he was able to conquer the greatest trial. Dying on a cross for the sins of his people. Having all of his friends re re um, um, go away. In that moment, there was no one else but him and the Father. And you think that when this trial came to Jesus, you thought that he was caught off God. He was never once caught off God. In John chapter 2, at the wedding in Cana, he says to Mary, my hour has not yet come. Referring to the time of his death. He says, my hour ain't come yet. But then in John 12, as he starts his way to Jerusalem to get the cross, my hour has come. He controlled everything, church. No one took his life. He says, I lay it down. And I got the power to take it back up again. You see, that's the one who holds our salvation. And no one can pluck us out of the palm of his hand. You see, these disciples, when they saw their Savior dying on the cross, oh, they failed the test. But when Jesus rose from the dead, they passed every test, man, after that. What changed? What changed with these coward disciples? What changed? They received power through the Holy Spirit. And they saw Jesus conquering death, sin, hell, Satan, and every enemy, and the grave, and everything. And they say, look, I ain't got to worry about nothing else. Because Jesus overcame the world. The good news is that when Jesus rose from the dead, he rose with a brand new creation. The one that entered the holies of holies. And Romans 8 tells us he is the firstborn among many brethren. That's what it took for any of us to see the Father. We needed a new creation. We didn't need, we, we can't come through the old sinful Adam. We need this perfect one who is 100% God and he took on flesh and he took that old sinful body of Adam to the cross. He received the condemnation that was for us, but he rose justified. He rose with the new body, the new creation. And the father was so pleased when Jesus ascended to heaven. He said, Jesus, sit at my right hand until I make all your enemies your footstool. And this Jesus is now sitting at the right hand of the Father, what represents the seat of authority. In Matthew 28, he says, all power and authority has been given to me. Therefore, go into this world that hates Jesus. Go into the world and guess what you're going to do? Preach it and teach it, for I'm with you. Preach the gospel, teaching all my disciples, for I'm with you until the end of the age. And that's exactly what these disciples did. Because they saw their Lord and Savior in the most powerful place that anyone ever was in. And what I'm saying to you, Christian, if you're a believer today, what I'm saying to you is when Jesus went 
into the holies of holies. And he is now seated at the, high, uh, at the highest power, the right hand of the Father. The Bible says that Christians are seated with him in heavenly places. Oh yeah, that's where we are. Yes, we got this old body from Adam. But when I read the word, it says when Christ returns, he's going to give us the new one, the glorious one. And he will finish the salvation that he started through the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul says, if any man be in Christ, he is what? New creation. We talk about the sins of the old one. But the Christian has passed on. He is in the new one. This new creation that God promises to all of his followers. New heaven, new earth, new creation, new body, no more sin, righteousness dwelling there. Just perfect peace and holiness. That's where we're on to. We're trusting in Jesus who has taken us to the hope of glory. So when we read these words this morning. If you're a Christian, you know exactly what I'm talking about. In, thir in verse 33 of John 16, Jesus says, I've said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. But take heart. Because this Jesus, oh, he overcame the world. Ultimately, the Christian will walk through this life and we will be just like those disciples. We're going to fail a few tests. We're going to pass a few tests. But ultimately, the Christian hope does not lie in the test that he fails. Our hope lies in being in Christ. This one who has overcome the world. Listen to the Apostle John as he writes. The same John who wrote. This gospel that we're preaching from the day. He wrote 1 John chapter 5 verse 4 to 5. And read it with me. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? of God. You read those words every time you go through a trial. You say, I'm in Christ. Great is he that's in me than he that is in this world. And because I'm in Christ, I've overcome already. Where is your confidence this morning? Have you come to the end of yourself? Have you put your faith in Christ? This one who can give us the only surety that we can ever overcome this world. I don't know where you are this morning. But I still hear Jesus' voice saying, come unto me. All with heavy laden burdens. And I'll give you rest. That's the good shepherd. You listen to his voice. Put your trust in him, church. Oh, I don't know the trials. But I know him. I know him who knows all things. I know he overcame. And he has given us his spirit. You come to Jesus. Trust in him. Amen. Father God. Thank you for expounding these scriptures to us this morning. John chapter 16, verse 24 to 33. In this world, you will have trials and tribulations. But be of good cheer. Be courageous. For Jesus Christ has overcome the world. That is our song this morning. That is our message this morning. Holy Spirit, will you convict hearts? Cause us to come to the end of ourselves. To trust in Jesus alone. May you strengthen hearts this morning. May you bring us to see Jesus high and lifted up. This one who has overcome the world. May we see his glory. Oh God. 
We need you so much. Help us to understand our weakness this morning. That we're not strong on our own. But we need the good shepherd. We need the provisions that he has left for us in the Holy Spirit. The written word. The church. The fellowship of believers. We need it all. God, I pray that you would open the eyes of all of us this morning. And that we would rest our hearts. And rest every trial in the master's hand. May you be glorified. In Jesus name I pray.